To tell the story of Khosro Anushirawan, ruler of a golden age, we first have to understand his father, Kavad. Kavad ruled the great empire of Iran. The West called it Persia, and he saw that empire brought to the brink of collapse. And boy oh boy did he not enjoy that experience. Prince Kavad spent his childhood like most young boys do, held hostage by his father's greatest enemy. His captors were the Hephthalites, a Central Asian tribe that had pushed their way up to the borders of Iran. They were new, they were powerful, and they had made the Iranians very, very nervous. Their relationship had started so well, though. They had helped Kavad's father win his throne, they had fought at his side in a couple of wars, but then they got into an argument over who controlled a town on their shared border. Naturally, Kavad's father had gone to war over it, and he had lost. He had lost so badly that the Hephthalites actually took him captive, and he'd had to pay his own ransom just so he could go back to ruling Iran again. He was a little testy about that, and so of course he went to war with them a second time, and he lost again. This time, he was forced to give them Kavad as a hostage, because surely he wouldn't attack them again if they held his son. He did, though. I mean, the third time's the charm, right? And he didn't get captured this time. He got killed, along with the rest of the Iranian army. The Hephthalites pushed forward, and the Iranians were in a panic. Kavad's uncle had been put on the throne, but man, he did not know what to do. Enter Sukra, a minister to the former Shah and leader of a powerful noble family. He took command of the army and managed to stop the Hephthalite advance. Sukra then negotiated the terms of a new truce, agreeing to pay a heavy tribute in exchange for peace and the return of all Iranian property, including the dead Shah's son, Kavad. Sukra returned home a hero. People celebrated him in the streets. But Kavad wasn't so lucky. Though he was the previous Shah's son, the noble families of Iran decided to elect Kavad's uncle as the new Shah. After all, how could they trust this boy who had just spent years as a prisoner of the enemy? One noble even wanted to see Kavad executed, but Sukra, who had just gone to all this trouble rescuing the kid, managed to convince the nobles to merely imprison Kavad instead. So the poor kid got sent away yet again, this time to the Fortress of Oblivion. I am not kidding, that was the prison's actual name. Don't say history never gave you anything. Honestly, Kavad had been better off with the Hephthalites. Sure, he had been their prisoner, but they always treated him like more of a guest. And frankly, prisons don't earn names like Fortress of Oblivion for being comfortable. Somehow, though, Kavad managed to escape, and when he did, he ran right back to the Hephthalites. He promised them gold, and in return, they promised to help him win back his rightful throne. Thus, in 488 CE, Kavad marched to the capital at Tessiphon with a sizable foreign army at his heels. This time, the nobles sided with him, as did Sukra. They deposed his uncle without a fight, and Kavad was confirmed as the new Shah. Sukra became his advisor and tutor, since the new Shah was still pretty young and had definitely not spent much time in Iran recently. At first, Kavad welcomed Sukra's advice, but he eventually came to realize that his so-called advisor wanted him as a puppet, not a Shah. When people had problems in need of solving, they always brought those problems to Sukra. And when Kavad tried to weigh in with his own suggestions, everybody ignored him. He soon realized that the crown he wore and the throne he sat on were mere decoration. Sukra truly ruled this empire. Now, it is true that a handful of noble families had always been the real power behind the throne of Iran. It had been that way for centuries. But they were supposed to stay behind the throne. They each oversaw specific regions on the Shah's behalf, much like feudal lords. And while the locals might serve their noble families, those families were supposed to serve the Shah. It had worked this way for so long that the biggest noble families, like Sukras, had been in power even longer than the Sasanian dynasty Kavad descended from. And yeah, the nobles had always meddled in royal affairs. Kavad's uncle was not the first Shah they had deposed, and he would not be the last. But the way Sukra was now holding court and giving orders on the Shah's behalf? That was not done. After five years of struggling to assert control over his own advisor, Kavad ordered Sukra to leave the capital and go back to his home city. Sukra obeyed, but only because it put him out of the Shah's reach. From such a safe distance, he could brag openly about how Kavad wouldn't even have a throne if not for him. And even living away from the capital, he held all the power. The empire's taxes were still brought to him. He still commanded the army. Kavad had nothing. 
The stars had aligned for Sukra. To all appearances, he stood on the brink of claiming the throne for himself. This is what Kavad had counted on. If he knew one thing about Iran's noble families, it was this. Through all the centuries of intrigue, manipulation, and outright bloodshed, the one thing that always served to keep noble families in check was their rivalry with other noble families. Now, with Sukra visibly rising to new heights of power, and openly bragging about it no less, his most bitter rivals took action. Egged on by Kavad, they gathered and raised their own army to march on Sukra's home. Soon, they deposited both Sukra and his vast treasury at Kavad's feet. The young Shah had eliminated the greatest threat to his reign while barely lifting a finger. Sukra was executed and removed from the board, but Kavad was just getting started. Never again would he allow a noble family to rise against him the way Sukra just had. The nobles must be cut off at the knees. See, a new movement had been brewing in Iran ever since the death of Kavad's father. The threat of a Heftalite invasion had sent a ripple of fear through the empire, and in that atmosphere, people had turned to new faiths with new answers. One priest in particular named Mazdak had split from the official tenets of Iran's Zoroastrian religion and begun preaching a new doctrine. Mazdak believed in peace, free love, and eating veggies. He was basically a 5th century hippie and he argued for the complete redistribution of wealth and the peaceful elimination of entrenched upper-class nobility like Sukra. Kavad liked that last idea very much. So the Shah gave up meat, embraced free love, and became a Mazdakite. With Kavad's blessing, Mazdak threw open the imperial granaries and began distributing food to the people. They also divided up land that had been held by the noble families for centuries, weakening noble control of the realm. For the first time in Kavad's reign, the people loved him. They sang his praises the way they used to sing Sukras for saving them from the Heftalites. But both the nobility and the high-ranking priesthood, those powers which had stood behind the throne for centuries, hated him. Kavad had made a mistake. Maybe he thought he could restrain Mazdak's more ambitious ideas about equality. Or maybe he thought that this popularity with the people would keep him safe. But he had reached too far too fast. The nobles rose up against him, deposed him, and once again threw him into the Fortress of Oblivion. Boy, I love that name. They then put his younger brother on the throne to undo Mazdek's reforms and be their new puppet Shah. Alas, though the Fortress of Oblivion continued to have a very, very cool name, it also continued to be very, very bad at containing Kavad's. Kavad escaped once again and fled to his old friends, the Heftalites. I think it might be time to face the hard truth that the Fortress of Oblivion was just not a very good prison. Yes, I am disappointed too. The Heftalites were just as happy to accept Kavad's money as last time, though. So once again, he boldly marched up to Tessiphon. His poor brother, who had never really been that into this whole Shah idea anyway, quickly stepped aside, and for the second time, Kavad became the Shah of Iran. But it's fair to say at this point that Kavad's reign had thus far been... Mm, troubled. One disaster after another, really. And all of these upheavals had left the empire weak. The army was still under the fractured control of the noble families, and Iran's wealth was being sapped away year after year in costly tributes to appease the Heftalites. And to top it off, Mazdek and his followers continued to push their aggressive social reforms forward, even after Kavad had tried to tone down his support of their ideals. Things did not look good for the K-Man, but he was undeterred. Kavad believed he could bring his empire back from the brink of ruin, but it would take a lifetime, perhaps even two lifetimes. Luckily, he might just have two lifetimes to work with. Just before he had been deposed, a new wife had given birth to his third son. The boy was young, but Kavad saw potential in him. This child could be molded to carry on the legacy that Kavad now hoped to build. That boy's name was Khosrow.